If you haven't listened to it, I would encourage you to go back. Uh, my wife and I listened to his message last week. It's good. It's deep. I mean, it's really deep. Uh, actually, when my wife and I were watching, one of us fell asleep during it. And I won't say who, but one of us fell asleep during it. Um, but seriously, Ryan did a phenomenal job. If you listen to it once, listen to it a second time, there is a, a deep, deep well in that message that we can draw from. But he began his message by talking about the fact that we are currently living in a truth crisis. We are in a truth crisis. And our, our culture today, particularly uh, the younger generation, Gen Z, is susceptible to mistruths, half-truths, outright falsehoods. And he gave this three-part framework on how we can engage in truthing well. And again, listen to that if you haven't listened to it. But um, with that in mind, given the state of our culture's relationship to the truth, it shouldn't be a surprise to us that in 2016, the Oxford Dictionary named the word post-truth as the international word of the year. And if you don't know what post-truth is, essentially post-truth means it is not objective facts that are informing your your decisions and your opinions of things, they are appeals to your emotions and your beliefs. For many people today, those things are ultimately what determines truth. You've likely heard phrases, my truth, his truth, her truth. Those sayings, while they have the word truth in them, really don't have a whole lot to do with truth. What somebody is saying, that this, they're saying, this is what I feel, or this is what I believe, and because I feel this and or believe this, therefore, it makes it true. Truth is considered by more and more people today to be something subjective, and there's less and less of a need to look towards an objective source of truth, and by that I mean God. God is seen as increasingly irrelevant and unnecessary in our culture today. So if you do away with God, you do away with truth. If you try to do away with God in our culture, eventually you will do away with truth. So if you are the measuring stick for whether or not something is true in your life, and I am the measuring stick for whether or not something is true in my life, what happens is we become our own sovereign instead of God, okay? And there are a myriad of ways this plays out in our culture. Perhaps the most prominent one is the culture's increasing acceptance of, of things like gender identity, right? Something that's untethered from sound science and, and biological reality, right? The increase in things like this and many, many, many other things in our culture, believe it or not, they come from the information sources that we rely on to tell us what's truth. And to today's young people, and actually all sorts of people, are increasingly reliant on their technological devices to tell them what's true. I'll, I'll give you an example. When we were on vacation uh, during the 4th of July weekend, we went to this big like celebration, block party type of a thing around the corner from the house that we were staying at. And as we were coming back, heading back to the house, we passed by these four girls. They were sitting on a park bench. They were mid to late teens in age. And all four of them had their heads tilted down, neck at a 45-degree angle, eyes glued to the blue light on their screen, scrolling with their thumbs next to one another. Like, this is how we spend time with one another these days, it seems. But that is our primary source of truth. And the more and more and more we are focused on the, our digital devices, the more we become untethered and disembodied from actual existence and the less of a grip we'll have on physical reality and truth. What's actually true? So living your truth, it's an incoherent ex exercise. And it's also an incredibly lonely one and a depressing one. There's a French sociologist by the name of Elaine Ehrenberg, and he wrote a book called The Weariness of Self. And in the book, he said this. 
He said, depression is the inexorable counterpart of the human being who is his or her own sovereign. Now, I'll admit that I spend a lot of time on my phone, like all of us do. So by a show of hands, how many of us have smartphones here in this place? Okay. Now, keep your hands raised if this device has led to a better, happier, and healthier version of you. Ah, all the hands go down, right? Okay. As they should, right? Yet many of us are what? We are living our lives through our phones. With the rise of excessive digital consumption, the rise in mental health issues, in loneliness, a lack of preparedness for adulthood, among many, many other things, are becoming more commonplace. In her book, iGen, author Jean Twenge, she notes the trend of loneliness and depression in young people starting when the iPhone hit the market in 2007. Isn't that interesting? So that's a depressing picture, and I don't mean to depress you this morning, but I think it's important that we acknowledge the reality of where our culture is in terms of how we view the truth, how we view God, and just some of the fallout that's taken place as a result of it. It, Yesterday's event is an example of it. It is. But there's two big questions that I want to invite you to consider with me as we um, get ready to open up the scriptures together. And the first one is simply this. What are my primary sources of truth? What are your primary sources of truth? What, what or who are you allowing to shape your conception of who God is, what the world is, who you are? What are those wells that you're drawing from primarily? What does that look like for you? What are the books and the blogs and the articles, the conversations, the social media interactions you're having with people? Because whether you realize it or not, whether you're conscious of it or not, those things are shaping your conception of truth. So what are my primary sources of truth? And the second question is this. It leads us into the series we're going to be doing for the entire summer. Am I a wiser person because of them? Am I living as a, a person with wisdom as a result of the sources of truth I am running towards? Because the truth is, our conception of truth, what we believe truth is, will lead us to make decisions that are either wise or foolish in nature. Decisions that will lead to the flourishing of our soul or the withering of it. Right? So simply look at your decisions, look at your choices. Have they led you to a fuller and richer life or a more diminished and depressing one? Right? And those decisions all flow back to the sources of truth that you're going to, the well that you are running to day in and day out, sometimes without even considering it. So we're going to look at how we can draw from sources of truth and how God might use those sources to turn us into people, to transform us into people who live with wisdom. And we're going to define what wisdom is in a minute, but wisdom is this non-negotiable essential to living the good and the true and the beautiful life that God invites us to. Okay. So even though I gave you some depressing news at the beginning of my message, the good news is that God is not surprised by it. He's not caught off guard by the crisis of truth that we're currently living in and the lack of wisdom that's resulted from it. In fact, God thought ahead of this. He was prepared for it. In fact, there's a whole genre of literature within the library of Scripture that God has given to us to, to look at, to read, to consider, and to apply to our life. It's shocker, it's called wisdom literature. And uh, w wisdom literature is, they're, they're not just these sayings that call us to action, they're much more than this, but they're about how we can live in step with the truth and move through life with intelligence, with understanding, with common sense, and live in a way that actually leads to our flourishing. So we'd be wise to set our attention on these books if we want to learn wisdom. And Proverbs is one of these books, and it's sometimes considered this practical guide for how to live a good and effective life, and it is that, but it's far more than that. I don't want us to turn the sayings that we find in this book into a nice collection of sort of 
pithy statements and tidbits and helpful sayings that you might hear from mom and dad or when you crack open a fortune cookie, something like that. While these are collections of short sayings that call us to action, they're more than helpful advice. These insights are drawn from the well of eternity. They are eternal truth that we are reading when we read them. And whether the onlooking world realizes it or not, they, they have this inner ache for intimacy with God. But that intimacy with God cannot happen by osmosis. That intimacy takes place when we actually order our lives with the truth. Ordering our lives with the truth is what wisdom is really all about. And it's not ordering our lives with truth as we see it, not truth as we wish it was, not my truth or her truth or his truth, but the truth. And it's when we fail to do this that we wreck our lives. Right? Nobody woke up one morning and decided, hey, I'm going to just make a complete mess of my life. Like, that's my goal in life. See, it's not that we plan to wreck our life. It's that we don't plan not to. The book of Proverbs helps us not to. Now, in this book, um, we see a regular contrast between what's referred to as the, the wise and foolish person or the prudent or simple person. Ryan introduced some of that to us last week. But wisdom is this essential thing that we need to what we call foolproof our, our life. So we're going to start at the very beginning of Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 1. Starting in verse 1, here's how it reads. The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction, to understand words of insight, to receive instruction in wise dealing, in righteousness, justice, and equity, to give prudence to the simple, knowledge and discretion to the youth, let the wise hear and increase in learning, and the one who understands obtain guidance. To understand a proverb and a saying, the words of the wise and their riddles. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. All right, so we find in this passage at the beginning of it that the author of this particular proverb and many of the proverbs we're going to read throughout the summer is King Solomon, who is king over the nation of Israel. And what he's doing here is he's writing with the voice of a father to his child. So primarily, he is writing to a younger generation to give them knowledge, to give them truth so they can live with wisdom. But as he says in this, of course, anyone will benefit from it, the the foolish, the simple, as well as the wise and prudent can benefit from this. So anyone at any stage and every stage physically and spiritually can benefit from these, these insights that we find in Proverbs. Now, we don't have time to get into everything that this says today, uh, but we'll get into these themes as we go through the, the summer. But I want to hit on some of the high points, and I want you to, to note here the words that get repeated you have the words wise or wisdom, instruction, understanding, knowledge. We have these words repeated in just a few verses. But far and away, the most common one that's repeated over and over is the word wisdom or, or wise. Now, like it or not, you and I go to sources for instruction, for understanding, for knowledge, we go to these things for, for how we can live the good and full and abundant life. But these knowledge sources that we go to, these sources we go to to tell us what's true, maybe we've never considered that they could either make us spiritually healthy or sick. Right? So good intake leads to life. Bad intake doesn't. So we need Good intake from time-tested, trustworthy sources that can make us wise. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. So <clears throat> before we can do that, we've got to sort of define what wisdom is and what wisdom isn't. Um, 
when we're talking about wisdom, we're not talking about knowledge. Uh, wisdom and knowledge go hand in hand, but they're, they're not the same thing. Right? I don't know how you all feel about AI, but uh, AI can process more information in seconds than I can in an entire year. Okay? AI will always be able to accumulate more knowledge than a human being. But AI can never be more wise than a human being. That is a uniquely human characteristic that, that nothing else in creation has the capacity to possess. Okay? Wisdom also isn't reserved for people who have reached a certain level of education. Right? I know plenty of wise people who don't have a bachelor's or a master's degree, and they are incredibly, incredibly wise. Right? Wisdom can be helpful in, in getting that wisdom. Can, that can happen in education, for sure. It can be a tool in that, but it's not essential for it. So wisdom isn't knowledge. Wisdom is applied knowledge. Right? Wisdom isn't knowledge. Wisdom is applied knowledge. It's not about having the right answers. I know lots of people who can come up with the right answers to things who do not live with wisdom. Wisdom isn't right knowledge, it's right living. Right? Now, knowledge and wisdom, they have this symbiotic relationship with one another. Uh, but when we have wisdom, we can discern good decisions from bad decisions. And we can discern good information from bad information. Right? The theologian A.W. Tozer, he compares wisdom to that of a vitamin. He says this, it does not nourish a body in itself, but if not present, nothing will nourish the body, just like a vitamin will make everything else work. I love that picture. It's really helpful. But unlike a vitamin, you can't go to CVS and pick up some wisdom on the, and, uh, at the counter, right? So according to this passage that we just read, what is the beginning of wisdom? Where does it start? Let's go back to the scripture. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. It's the beginning of a life that is wise. Right now, the common understanding of fear in this text is not like the type of fear that we might have when we go to see a scary movie, something along those lines. It's more like this. It's more like when you say go out at to the Grand Canyon, and you, you look out, and you're just overcome by, by awe and by just this sense of reverence, and you're just taken aback by what you're looking at. But you realize that while you're looking at this thing of indescribable beauty, that if you take a wrong step, your life is done. That's the type of fear that we're talking about. It's this sense of awe and this reverence that we have uh, before God. But according to the Proverbs... Wisdom is God-created, it is God-given, as we just read, it is God-fearing. In other words, if we don't have the proper understanding of who God is and who we are in light of who God is, we will not live with wisdom, and it's God-oriented. Right? James, uh, who is the half-brother of Jesus, carries this idea into the New Testament where he writes that all wisdom comes from above. It comes from God himself. So to put it simply, God is the standard, the source, and the keeper of wisdom. God is the standard and the source and the keeper of wisdom. And although it is God's to give to us, he is very generous with it. He is very willing to give us wisdom. In fact, the guy that writes this proverb, King Solomon, there's this moment where God is having a conversation with him. And God says to Solomon, says, Solomon, you can ask me for anything that you want, anything at all. Can you imagine just being one request away from getting anything you want, anything you want at all? What would you ask for? Just think to yourself. Solomon doesn't ask what many of us would ask for. He asks for wisdom. He asks for an understanding mind. He asks for the ability to discern good from bad so he could live in right relationship with God. And God gives it to him. And he is happy to give it to us if we ask him. Right? Now, 
what I'm going to do here is I'm going to give us some really practical insights, some, some things that we can grab onto, some handles that will help us immensely in our pursuit of wisdom. But here's one thing I can't give you. I cannot give you the fear of God. I can't give that to you. Now, I'm, I'm confident that the content that I'm going to be talking about is going to be wonderfully helpful for you. But it is only good if the fear of God is at the foundation of your life. That's the only way it's going to be helpful. Right? So I put it this way. We cannot bypass the source of wisdom in our pursuit of wisdom. We can't bypass the source of wisdom in our pursuit of wisdom. Now, I asked two questions towards the beginning of the message, and they were this. What are your primary sources of truth? And then, are you wiser because of them? And so much of what I say for the remainder of this time uh, will hopefully be to help you have better sources of truth and get a realistic picture of how you're going about pursuing that in your life. And much of what I say comes from this book uh, written by the name, a guy by the name of Brett McCracken. It's called The Wisdom Pyramid. It's an excellent, excellent book. But <clears throat> I believe this is a critical read for anybody who is seeking after truth and how we live in light of the truth in the middle of a post-truth age. And what he does in this book is he takes this concept of the, the food pyramid and he translates it for spiritual, our spiritual life. Right? And so, in the food pyramid, what do we have? You have the base of the pyramid, and that makes up the food group that you should be consuming the most of. And then as you ascend up the pyramid, they become foods that you could consume less of because they are less and less healthy. Right? So, that's, that's how the food pyramid works. Um, now, I would like to think, I wish, that because a slice of pizza is sort of the shape of a pyramid, that it would give me all of the health that I need, and I could just say, okay, close enough, this is, is fine. But everybody knows that a steady diet of pizza or ice cream and Sour Patch Kids is going to earn you uh, some health problems and probably an early death. We know that. But we haven't applied the same logic to our souls, have we? We haven't. Not all sources of information lead to wisdom, do they? Have you ever considered that not all the information that you consume on a daily basis is essential or beneficial to you? Have you ever considered that? Not all the information you consume leads you to a more Christ-like existence. Have you considered that? Now, the wisdom pyramid gives us this visual to help us nourish our souls and live with wisdom if we approach God with fear or humility towards him. So here's the wisdom pyramid. On the bottom of the pyramid, you have the Bible. You have the word of God. Ascending up, you have the church. Then you have nature, creation. You have books. You have beauty. And then finally, at the very, very, very tippy top, you have um, the, the internet, right? Now, I don't know if you noticed this, but maybe you have, that we've sort of flip-flopped this on its head, haven't we? We've taken the most fleeting and unreliable source of truth and information and used it as our primary source of it, haven't we? Right? As one author says, he says, the most fleeting human sources of wisdom now occupy our epistemological foundation. In other words... What we determine as truth is no longer drawn from God and his word primarily, but from our screens. But we need an eternal and trustworthy source of wisdom that all other sources can be measured against. And millennia of history has proven that God's word is that source. But to have wisdom, we need the fear of God. We need humility. That's the starting spiritual posture of wisdom. But then the starting source of wisdom is the scriptures. Right? The Bible has endured in every single age. 
And the reason why it has endured is because it represents the most reliable source of knowledge and truth, God himself. And there's this inextricable link that exists between God and his word. So if we love God, we'll love his word. If we fear God, we'll fear his word. If we see Jesus as authoritative in our our life, we'll treat the scriptures as authoritative as well, which Jesus did. But this is a challenge for us because we live in a day where any idea, any hint of something or someone having authority over us is like a sin, right? Because we see personal autonomy in our day as this supreme virtue. And we could deceive ourselves into thinking that we're the only ones that we need to figure out how to flourish in the world. And it's just not true. To quote J.I. Packer, he says, True wisdom begins with a willingness to treat God's word as possessing final authority. Man is not the measure of all things. God is. Man is not the measure of all things. God is. So when the Protestant Reformation unfolded 500 years ago, there was this this defining mantra that came out of this movement. One of them, which was sola scriptura, scripture alone, right? Right? So that doesn't mean Scripture is the only authority for our life, but it's the only infallible authority, only authority that is without error. Now, there's other authorities outside of the Word of God, right? We we know this. Governments are authorities over nations. Parents are authorities over their children. Teachers are authorities over their classroom, all these types of things. And these are valuable, and these are necessary forms of authority, but they are fallible. They can make mistakes, The Word of God is the only infallible one because it represents God himself. Jesus himself, in Matthew 24, verse 35, said, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Shocker, Jesus was right, right? To this day, the Bible is the most widely sold and distributed piece of literature in the world with over 5 billion copies. It's astounding. My word will never pass away. So if you want to gain wisdom, put away your phone. Better yet, put it off, turn it off. Two, open his word with a humble and teachable spirit. Give time and space as well for the Holy Spirit of God to teach you through it. Because if you rush through it like it's just like another thing on your list that you need to do, you're not going to glean anything from it. Sit with it. Sit with God as you're reading it. And let him speak to you through it. So the word of God makes up the the foundation for what determines truth. But then we have the church. Uh, Hebrews 10, 24 and 25. It reads, let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. So as we look at the church as this source of of truth where we gain wisdom, I realize that this one can come with some baggage. This can be hard for for some of us because there are, are all sorts of headlines that are talking today about how people are leaving the church in droves There's this this new phenomenon taking place in our country right now that is referred to as the Great De-Churching, where 40 million people who once were part of a local congregation worshiping Jesus now no longer affiliate with the church at all. So this is a a very real thing, and it's to some degree understandable why people have left churches. Interpersonal conflict, leadership scandals, hypocrisy, abuses of authority, cover-up, marrying faith to politics, all sorts of things have led people to leave churches. And you pair that with our culture of of good vibes only where we can so easily filter out anything that's troublesome or difficult or makes us uncomfortable. Church can sometimes feel like more trouble than it's worth, right? But even for believers we got to admit, Christianity has mostly been defined by your personal relationship with Jesus and your heaven ticket getting punched. 
And that's what we've made it. We haven't really made it about anything else. So if there's something that happens in a church that just makes us uncomfortable or that we disagree with, it becomes really easy for us to sort of disengage and, and find another church. And to be fair, there are valid reasons to leave a church. But I think there's a whole lot of bad reasons that we've, we've used to justify our leaving. But I love how Brett McCracken put it. I don't have it on the screen, but I just want to read this. He says, a church community frees you from the crushing weight of self-obsession. It frees you to be part of something bigger than yourself with people who are not like you. It frees you from the bias-confirming bubbles of only being exposed to like-minded people who always affirm but never challenge you. Let me say it frankly. For your walk with Jesus to grow, you cannot only be accountable to yourself. You can't. If what you believe, how you like to worship, how you inter interpret the Bible, how you live are never, ever challenged, they're only affirmed, you will never become wise. And this will sound harsh, but if you never are accountable to anybody else, you risk being locked in this perpetual cycle of one bad decision after another. You need to have other believers who can speak wisdom and truth into your life. And if you don't permit that or you decide you're going to resist that, disaster is around the corner. Disaster is around the corner. So we surround ourselves with wise people. That's the benefit of the church. And that we can give ourselves to community. Even when it feels uncomfortable. Even when we don't want to. Being a part of a church community, it helps us anchor our souls to God-centered rhythms in a me-centered age. I don't know about you, but coming together to worship and to, to open up God's word together, to, to center our attention on God during prayer, it reminds me that while I'm a part of this larger story that God is telling, I am not the star. Jesus is. That's the whole point. The other six days of the week, we're talking a whole lot about ourselves, thinking a whole lot about ourselves, and surrounded by people who are. But it's only in the worship context where we can come together and we can direct our attention back to God and his wisdom and his grace and his mercy and his attributes. We don't do that when we're just by ourselves, typically. Like anything, coming together as a church, it just comes down to habit. And there's this inertia that so easily pulls us away from community. And it turns out, based on the scripture that we just read, that it was this inertia that was kind of becoming a part of the early church as well. Don't give into it. Don't give into it. Make being a part of your church family a priority. Because these occasional, when I feel like it, appearances do not form you into a person of wisdom. They don't. Showing up weekly to a space that's designed to direct your attention away from yourself can, and they will, if you are humble. All right. So we have the scriptures, we have the church, and then next we have nature or creation. There's this, this headline that came out in the LA Times several years ago, and it read, we may live in a post-truth era, but nature does not. And I love that. Nature is beautiful, it's wonderful, it's majestic, it's awe-inspiring, and it is terrifying. How many of you got a little anxious when you got the tornado warning last week, right? A little bit. How many of you were excited about it? Okay, some of us, okay. All right. For the rest of us normal people, um, I, it's Pastor Joe raising his hand so I can say that. But <clears throat> here's the thing about creation, though. Creation is what it is, not what we want it to be. Whether the weather is sunny or it's rainy or it's blizzarding outside, I have no control over it. All I can do is prepare for it. Um, but what's fascinating about creation, as we consider it, is when we read the book of Pro Proverbs, we find that wisdom was actually present when God created the world. Listen to Proverbs 8. This is verse 27. When he established the heavens, I was there. When he drew a circle on the face of the deep. And then a little further down in verse 29, it reads, 
when he assigned the sea to its limit so that the waters might not transgress his command, when he marked out the foundations of the earth, then I was beside him like a master workman, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing before him always. Okay. So wisdom is present with God at the creation of the world. That's fascinating. And just like we can learn something about Vincent van Gogh by looking at one of his paintings, or we can learn something about Christopher Nolan by watching one of his films, we can learn something about who God is by observing his creation. We can. Now, there's some cautions that come with this because creation is not a God to worship. Rather, it is an amplifier of God's glory, right? It's an amplifier of God's glory. And we have to be careful not to elevate nature above God, and we have to be careful even not to elevate nature above humanity because humanity is also part of creation as well. But unlike every other part of creation, you and I bear God's image uh, Psalm verse, uh, chapter 8 rather, tells us that we are the crown of creation. God set us as the crown of creation. And so nature includes us. And we're actually told we're given authority over creation in, uh, in Genesis. So it should be no surprise to you and me that, that we can feel more connected to God and actually experience his peace when we're in God's creation because we are God's creation. We have to approach it with caution, not to elevate it above God and not to elevate it above humanity. And then finally, in the wisdom pyramid, we have books and we have beauty. And I'm going to bundle these two things together for uh, the sake uh, of time. Um, And some of you may know this about me, but I am in the regular habit of reading. Um, I have a few books in, um, in, on my shelf in, in my office here and several more at home. Uh, I do this every night. I'm reading a book before I go to bed. And one of the reasons why I love making reading a regular habit of mine is because it actually allows me to put into practice James 1.19. And this is essential to living with wisdom, guys. Be quick to listen, slow to speak. Because when you're taking the time to read a book, you're taking the time to hear somebody else's perspective who you may or may not agree with. Reading a good, solid book can cultivate humility in you because when you read someone else's words, you learn, number one, um, someone else's point of view. You better understand them, which is crucial to loving somebody well, but you also realize you have a limited perspective. That you are not infallible. You are a human that can have errors of judgment and perspective. And that's not to say we uncritically swallow somebody else's ideas. But when we read well, we can understand what somebody else is saying, what they're trying to to communicate. We can learn from it. But if we're using God's word as the foundational source, we can check it against what God's word teaches and discern truth from falsehood. Right Before Ryan came and spoke last week, we were talking about many different things. And in our conversation, he shared with me, and he's smart. He has a doctorate. Okay? He said, you know, Mike, the more I know about a subject, the more I find I don't know. The more I know, the more I find that I don't know. And that is such a wise perspective to have. You see, wise people know that they don't know. Foolish people think they know everything. Wise people know that they don't know. Foolish people think they know everything. I heard this true story of a guy who was a part of this Bible study, about 10 or 12 people or so. And the facilitator made, a, made an error or said something out of turn when they were communicating and he proceeded to correct them, and he said, you know what? He says, I have already know, I know everything that I need to know about the Bible. You or anyone cannot teach me anything. That is a foolish perspective to have. If you think you know everything, you'll have no use for reading good books. If you know you don't know everything, you will have plenty of use for them. If you are humble and you're curious, those are two things you have to have to have wisdom. You will have plenty of use for a good book. Now, 
one thing I think we should be doing is we should be in the habit of reading old books, right? You should be reading a book by a dead person. You should, right? Uh, C.S. Lewis said, said this, and I think there's a lot of wisdom here. He said, a new book is still on its trial and must be tested against the great body of Christian thought down the ages, right? It's not to say new books are bad, but they haven't been time-tested yet, so we have to be careful, and we have to be discerning. We have to act with wisdom when we're, when we're reading them. And here's what he says uh, further down. He suggests reading one old book for every three new books that we read, and he says the reason is every age has its own outlook. We all need books that will correct the characteristic mistakes of our own period. We're a product of the age we live in, like it or not. And if anything is true, it's this, that this age does not have the market cornered on truth. Might be the worst age for it, to be honest. We are a product of the age we live in, so we need wisdom and truth from ages past to correct us. So we get wisdom from reading good books. We can. But wisdom isn't just what we learn with our heads. It's also something that comes from our hearts. Wisdom can also be gleaned by looking at things of, of beauty. Right? When you hear a great song or you, you see a great work of, of cinema or other forms of creative art, they can stir your emotions and point you back to truth. They can. But you have to be cautious. Beauty can be a healthy part of our truth diet only when it is neither the most important nor the least important source of truth. It should not be the only source of truth. It's not the least important either. But truth and beauty, these things can work very, very powerfully together because both truth and beauty flow from the heart of our creator, whose scripture says, we'll make everything beautiful in its time. So when you see something of beauty, your first impulse shouldn't be to take a selfie with it, okay? But just be in awe, just to sit in silence, to, to live that truth of Psalm 4610, be still and know that I am God. Sometimes we just have to sit before things of beauty, and allow God to speak to us through it. God himself takes time to rest and enjoy the beauty of his creation. And we ought to do the same. Right. So, here's the wisdom pyramid. We'll go back to this. And we'll invite the, the band to come up and lead us in a final song. And as they do, just some things I want you to consider today. Um, one is, what is a simple thing you could do this week? to become a wiser person, All right? For you, it might be opening up your Bible and meditating on it, reflecting on it, allowing the, the truths of God's word to really speak to you. Maybe it's opening up your Bible for the first time, right? Maybe you've been spotty with coming to church each week and you're like, you know what? That, that kind of pierced my heart a bit. I need, to, I need to get back into the rhythm of doing that consistently, you might need to go out into creation and allow the, the, the being surrounded by nature to point you to the glory of God. Or you might open up an old book or look at a thing of beauty. I don't know what it is for you, but I think what we all can do is take this, this, this digital device, which isn't bad in and of itself, but instead of using it as the primary source of truth in our life, we, we manage it better. We steward it better. We put it in its proper place. And we turn it off after a certain time every single night to allow more time and space for good and healthy sources of truth that can lead us to become a person of wisdom. But again, we can't do this apart from the fear of God. We can't do this apart from having a humble and teachable spirit because we cannot bypass the source of wisdom in our pursuit of wisdom. With that in mind, let's pray. Lord Jesus, I confess to you that I have not always pursued you at first 
as my source of truth. Forgive me for that. Lord, I pray that we would be passionate and relentless in our pursuit of knowing the truth of your word, pursuing intimacy with you. Lord, would you create in us a clean heart? Would you renew a right spirit within us? Lord, would we have a proper fear of you, awe and reverence, coming before you as the source, the substance, the keeper of wisdom. And Lord, may we be those who would freely ask for it as we come before you. We pray these things in your name. Amen.